Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. This is 131 with Sebastian Carlson. He is the co-founder and COO of Sintage, a B2B platform that allows access to Mexican business data. This episode is going to be more on the personal side uh, and experience side because, like myself, he is an expat living in a foreign land doing business uh, locally. At least that was my experience in China a long time ago. And so uh, while his business is interesting in itself or on its own, the fact that he is so curious about other countries and cultures uh, aligns with me quite well, and so I want to explore that with him today, uh, since I think curiosity is one of the reasons why entrepreneurship and capitalism exist uh, you know, to begin with. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about your business and about yourself and how you found yourself in Mexico, and then we'll go from there. As you said, I'm Sebastian. Uh, I am of Swedish origin. Uh, I grew up in Sweden, haven't lived back home for uh, for quite some time. And the kind of story between leaving Sweden and ending up in Mexico uh, has a lot to do with curiosity, so, so happy to discuss that further. So today I find myself in Mexico City, um, where I run, I'm the COO of the company uh, we call Sintage. I say that because we recently changed name to Sintage from, from a less commercially apt name. Um, we're a business data platform that allows, for, allows, allows our customers to um, aggregate, and process and, and consume sort of business data. Uh, the most common use case is for credit risk analysis. So many of our customers are financial institutions that work with, work with SMBs and um, businesses providing loans and obviously uh, assessing the risk of those, of those interactions. So we um, aggregate, we extract data from different data sources, we process, uh, process this data and, and present it in a, in a sort of um, in a sort of consumable way for our for our customers that tend to be credit risk analysis analysts and other um, and other um, and other me members of the ecosystem that could also be investors anyone interested in analyzing other businesses really uh, tend to be interested in our platform. Uh, it's a business that we've had going on for two years. Uh, we started out bootstrapping. Uh, we grew really, really quickly. Currently, we sit on about 170 institutional customers. Uh, we have a team of 30, raised a bit of capital last year, and we're really looking forward to, to this 2023 and, and uh, uh, the challenges and the opportunities that we, will, that we will face in Mexico and possibly elsewhere as well. I would like you to touch on how you got to Mexico. So I did my studies in, in the UK after leaving, after leaving Sweden and uh, studies in, in UK and Spain and uh, graduated in 2005 and ended up working in, the, in, in a financial institution like everyone else at the time. Uh, so this was obviously before 2000 and 2007. Uh, so I started working in, uh, for a broker quickly then moved over to American Express uh, that was in, in Madrid. And in 2007, I was picked up by Santander, where I started working in kind of like a private banking uh, role, where Santander was speci specifically targeting these sort of mid-wealthy families, There's mostly expats on the Spanish coasts. So Spain has this little sort of function like Florida in the States, where, where a lot of expats move from, from Northern Europe um, to Spain and they tend to be retired. They might have sold their house back home, now live of renting, so they have a bit of, a bit of liquidity to invest. And that was our, our kind of target market. Um, so that's a really good introduction to, uh, to banking. After three years, I uh, uh, was chosen for, um, to, to join one of the sort of corporate development pro programs, co uh, or corporate tourism programs, as, as, as some people tend to, to name them. Um, I was sent from Spain to work in uh, to work in London for some time. Uh, after London, I moved to Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, worked for some time in uh, both of those destinations were in corporate banking. I moved back to headquarters in Madrid for some time to work in strategy to end up in Frankfurt back in back in corporate banking, corporate investment banking. All this time, I kind of always dreamt about two things: uh, to leave the bank, as everyone who who tends to work in a bank. 
Uh, another one was to to start my own start my own business, uh, as everyone who works in corporations tends to do. And then I uh, I also really wanted to come to Mexico. I have had I had had really good experiences in Mexico. I was really sort of interested by the opportunities, the culture in general. And a bit of a plus was that my brother, um, back in the year 2000, when him and I went on this sort of backpacking trip in Mexico, fell in love and ended up in Mexico. And in 2016, my niece was born. Uh, and out of this sort of curiosity and interest in Mexico on one end, uh, the interest of being a present uncle on the other, and a, a good job, a job opportunity that was landed. I actually left the bank to, to pick up on this opportunity and move to Mexico City. It's quite interesting because uh, the bank I was working for had, um, had has a very big presence in Mexico. And I asked them, like, always asked them, like, please move it to Mexico. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm happy to move around. Um, and when I asked for Mexico, they were just like, yeah, yeah, we'll send you to Mexico. We're just going to, we just, you just have to uh, spend a few years in, in London beforehand. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm happy to move, spend a few years in London. And then it became a few years in Brazil and a few years at headquarters and a few years in Germany. And basically when I've been everywhere at the bank, except from in Mexico, I, I had to take action myself and, and I moved. Um, and it was not pure coincidence. I, uh, contacted an old buddy of mine that I had met in, actually met surfing in, in Brazil, asking if he had an opportunity at the company that was called EFL at the time, Entrepreneurial Finance Lab, uh, working with credit scoring, working a lot commercially with the banks. Uh, I called him up and see to see if he had an opportunity for me in Mexico, and it turned out he did, and I moved here back in 2017. So I've actually lived now more in Mexico than I've lived anywhere else in my life. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm turning Mexican. I'm still sort of very, very Swedish, uh, but it's good. Uh, it's good. Uh, it's a really, it's, it's really turned into a land of opportunities, and and it's a culture that I'm that I'm, that I find myself very, very in peace with. Um, I started working for EFL. Uh, EFL did some very alternative credit scoring. Um, Back in 2017 and before that, uh, mostly based on, um, on psychometric data. So uh, what the company, the company did was to give the subject, the credit applicant, a questionnaire and extract metadata from that questionnaire and understand their credit worthiness, uh, especially applicable on microcredits and on the base of the pyramid that previously has had no loans and has no credit score or, or no reliable data around it. So it's a way to create data from scratch. Um, we, it worked really well with certain uh, financial institutions in, in Latin America, especially sort of microfinance institutes, etc. Uh, we later, in 2018, if I'm not wrong, we merged with a company called Lendo to come, become Lendo EFL. Uh, on paper, the two companies matched really well. Uh, Lando came with other kind of data sources, with tapping a lot into sort of Android data, social network data, email data. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the the merger did not work out really very well. I'm sure there were other factors, for, but from my point of view at the time, um, it was too much of a cultural cra crash, which basically led to the beginning of the end of, of that organization. It's still around but much, much more scaled than, than it was back in 2018. Um, and yeah, uh, that's pretty much the story, how I ended up here. In early 2020, I met my co-founder, Mateus Pedroso. Uh, Mateus had then previously worked as a CTO of a Mexican startup called Credit Justo. And uh, based on his experiences, his idea, he was sort of, um, he was sort of playing around with or with different data sources and ideas of how uh, could become kind of a data provider for Mexican fintechs. Um, we saw uh, I I joined as an kind of like an advisor uh, coming from the industry, understanding corporate banking and also a bit of a bit of startup experience. Um, and he showed me the sort of different alternatives that he was working on, and I saw the absolute potential of of um, of using the Mexican tax authorities as a database. The data 
that the Mexican tax authority has is uh, extremely, extremely rich when it comes to business data. But uh, it comes at the advantage for us that it's really not a tech company and it's definitely not data, a data analysis company. So it comes with a lot of failures, if you want to call it. So the basic, basic idea was to kind of create like an API data, uh, infrastructure layer on top of the Mexican ta uh, tax authorities in order to facilitate the sharing of data. So it facilitates um, the, for SMBs to share their data with third parties. Uh, and that's turned out to, that's how we started. Uh, we built a lot on top of that since then, but um, that's how we started. And uh, it's turned out to be an idea that, that has worked really well. Uh, so we've had uh, decent growth, growth over the last couple of years. And, and yeah, that's pretty much how I ended up here. Very fascinating, this idea of uh, building something savvy on top of government data, which is usually not well done. Um, so let's, let's go into the curiosity stuff and, and we'll, I'm sure in Mexico we'll, we'll come back into it somehow and your business and all of that. How do you define curiosity? It's really the, the, the feature that makes us interested in, 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 in learning new stuff and, and having new experiences, of course. Um, but the interesting thing about it is really what has, has, has allowed me to be, to end up where I am, uh, in all senses of the world, geographically, as well as sort of, as well as sort of, uh, career wise, etc. I'm sure it's something that you and I share as well, Sean, like listening to your podcast, I can, I can tell that you, you, you sit on a lot of curiosity. I ended up in China because I was curious about what it was like to live outside of America, especially because... Americans tend to be pretty like rigid in their understanding of the world and, and despite how ignorant it is in general. Um, and so they kind of have this opinion that America is the greatest in the world. Uh, and my, my lack of understanding of the world made me go, yeah, but you have no information to base this on. You say America is the best country in the world, but do you have a passport? Have you ever left the country? Uh, no. Okay, well, you should probably go check out other countries before you claim that America is the best. So I, I kind of felt that as a teenager and, and felt like it was something I owed to myself to go and live somewhere else and, and try it and uh, see what it was like. Did you discover in that, that, that America is the, is, the, is the best country in the world or, or, or how, 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 how did that fold out? I'm still gathering data, <laughs> but based on my experience in 36 countries over the last you know 19 years, I would say there is no best country. I like that idea. I kind of, I kind of tend to defend the idea that it's not a sort of linear relationship where you, you know, where, 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 where it's like a scale or it's like a kind of like a credit score and like the top score is, is, is the best country and the bottom score is the worst. There's definitely no such thing. I completely agree. Uh, I lived in, I think we added eight countries. So I've, no, I've lived it for, for yeah, I've lived for extended periods of time in so more than one year, at least in, in seven countries. And um, I, in most of these countries, I can find something that's the best. Sort of, you know, this, this country, you know, it has to be the best, you know, as it, it, you know, banal example. Sort of, Mexico must be the best country in the world for tacos. Like, the, you know, there's no competition. Like, definitely the best tacos in the world you find in Mexico. And uh, that's only an illustrative example, of course. But you can always find things that are the best in every country. You, know, you can probably find things that are worst as well. Like, I have no, that, that, there's no, there's no question about it. Um, so, so yeah, um, it's, a, it's a really valid point, and and I'm not, I'm not particularly surprised to hear that you haven't, you know, that the conclusion is, well, that the conclusion so far at least, is that there's no such thing as the best country in the world. I I think the conclusions I take are the country that's the best for me at the moment is the country I decide to live in. And when I feel like that country is no longer the best country for me, I leave. Of course, that becomes very subjective. And I, I think that's, that's, that's the way it should be because the idea of the best country in the world is a really sort of subjective idea. But on the way, I don't know if you agree that 
I'm sure you do, that there are sort of certain sort of objective uh, features that you can find or sort of features of culture or, or components of cultures that you can find that are kind of the best. Like I was, I was actually in the States the other day and, and I, 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 it was an unexpected trip and I, I, I went by myself. I was in Chicago. This was not when it was minus 30 Fahrenheit in Chicago, but, but anyway, it's slightly after, just after. And I just went into my bar, to a bar by myself in the evening, just a random sort of just bar in downtown uh, Chicago. And it took me about uh, a minute for some, someone just to approach me in a really friendly manner and just starting a conversation, just out of the blue, just a conversation. It was a half empty bar. Um, and someone else joined the conversation. First guy left, someone, third person joined the conversation. It turned into a full evening of just long conversations. And that kind of conversational culture and the possibility to approach someone like that without there being any sort of, without creating sort of misunderstandings or, you know, what, what is this weirdo up to? Um, I think is something that is spectacular in American culture and one of the sort of components that I can say that the, that is the best in the States. And I bring that with me to other countries. So, for example, I was in Portugal until November, and a few weeks before I left, I was at a restaurant working in the daytime, and there was a, a stranger, you know, a girl, ended up at the table next to me. We were both backs against the wall facing, you know, the rest of the room, and the restaurant was designed so that there was kind of like a basement area and a street level area. And you can get like coffee and dessert on the bottom and you order, you have to order f like meals on the top. So if you leave your laptop or whatever on the, the, you know, the bottom floor basement and, you know, and you go to order food, then like you're leaving your stuff there. And a lot of people in a lot of countries would feel uncomfortable with that. Fine. But in Portugal, it's kind of safe. People won't touch your things. However, you know, I don't want to leave my stuff there anyways. So Turned out, uh, one of the uh, like one of the waitresses um, came by, and I was like, "Hey, how do I order?" And she's like, "Oh, you have to go upstairs." And the girl then felt like that was an opportunity to talk, and she was like, "Oh, like that's my problem too. Like, I want to get food, but I gotta go upstairs." And I was like, "Look, why don't I go upstairs and order meals for both of us, so that you can stay and watch my things and and your things?" She's like, "Really? You would do that?" I'm like. You're like sitting right next to me and you've got a bunch of stuff with you. The chances of you taking my things and running in the next two minutes are quite low. So yeah, I'll do that. So um, she gave me some, some cash to pay for her meal and I got our food and came back. And then she's like, hey, like, why don't you sit at my table and eat with me? It's like, okay, fine. And turns out she's from Kosovo. Um, a lot of people don't know Kosovo is a very small country in uh, Eastern Europe, so Southeastern Europe. And she was like, this is why I love Portugal. I'm like, what? Why? Because you would never meet someone in my country who had the courage to just talk to a stranger or feel the, the desire to talk to a stranger in a public place like that. And I'm like dying to meet people just like you that are like willing to be, you know, vulnerable and, and outgoing and just talk with strangers. And so we ended up chatting for a few hours while we were, you know, still working. And, um, I was supposed to go out for dinner with some other friends that I had and she was just in town visiting for like a week or two. And so I invited her to dinner with us and she came to dinner with us and we went for a walk after dinner with, with this couple. And it was just this like really nice kind of, uh, you know, innocent, meeting of a stranger and, and making her feel at home in a foreign country for her. Um, that I, I think part of it is the American me that enables me to go, I'm here to make friends. I'm here to live life. I don't care. There's no point in being afraid or ashamed or embarrassed for craving sociability. Um, so yeah, that was, just one of a number of really, really cool experiences I've had. And we still keep in contact. And she's decided to actually move to uh, Lisbon. And she's in the process of making that happen now, which is pretty cool. 
something that has been sort of um, that has been sort of one of the milestones and one of the sort of one of one of the biggest sort of points to pinpoint on American culture is the way that how Americans move around. You know, the the the, the highest level of mobility in the world. You know, when there was when when there you know when there were, when jobs were created in back in the fifties in in Detroit, people moved from the south to 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 the north to 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 uh, uh, to get jobs, and that's something that the way that Americans always are created. So that might be sort of a, that might be like an economic fund, fundament of that kind of that kind of openness to to get to know new people. Um, something that's very much lacking in in a lot of European countries where where mobility is very low. Interesting thing about um, Lisbon here. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I have a feeling that Lisbon is becoming a bit of a mm, sort of. Uh, home office hub, should we call it that? Sort of distant worker, sort of uh, sort of digital nomads uh, moving about, and uh, I don't know if she was in the same kind of situation as you are, but obviously, you know, it would have been th that kind of situation might have been much uh, more difficult if it was actually someone from from Lisbon, or you know, or, or a group of people from Lisbon. Yes, you're right. Portuguese people are a lot more reserved. They are. Maybe when they are, but you know, she was from Kosovo, and maybe if you go to Kosovo, you find the same thing. But if you find a Portuguese person in, say, here in Mexico City or in London, you know, you would that that kind of situation, that kind of that kind of conversation, that kind of excuse to interact might have, might have made much more sense. It is culture specific because I've noticed in China and Vietnam, other countries in Asia. I mean, especially as a white man, as a white person. Um, they're already really curious and want to communicate with you, even just as friends. And especially when you walk up to them and you're speaking their language, they're like really, really like blown away and really want to communicate like as deeply as they possibly can and, and test your ability to communicate. It's a nice fall back to curiosity. And I find that a lot in Mexico as well. Maybe not so much where I live, with, which is in a part of Mexico City where there's a lot of expats. So it's, you know, you know, who, who are they going to pick from from all, all the thousands of expats that live in this in this neighborhood? But especially when I'm outside in different sort of maybe more sort of local neighborhoods in, in Mexico City or elsewhere in Mexico, you find you get a lot of curiosity and, and curiosity from from their end, and it gives a good excuse for people to approach you and 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 make contact in a way that might not have been so typical if it was between you know in this case Mexican to Mexican, right? I have uh, much more experience in Asia than Europe where in Asia I generally had a few expat friends but the majority of my friends were locals and so I thought moving to Portugal that I would do the same thing I'd have a lot of local friends and maybe a few expat friends what I've found is I have like one or two Portuguese friends, but like I have no dozens of expats and I met them all very easily. So the, it's not just that in Asia, um, you're more like, you, first of all, in Asia, you're less likely to meet expats because there just really aren't that many people making lives for themselves in Asian countries. In, in what, in what cities did you live? Uh, I was in Wuhan and Shenzhen and Saigon. So, so what was interesting was, uh, to start with, there weren't many expats, but then a lot of them really kept to themselves in small groups, and you just either wouldn't get the chance to meet them, or if you met them, you probably wouldn't pick to be their friend normally because they're a bit weird <laughs> you got to be a bit weird to like make a home in asia as a white person basically um but what i found in europe yeah but what i found in in lisbon so far is that they've got you know like tech jobs or their company founders or you know whatever they're they're doing something they're scientists they're researchers they're they're you know developers um, they're doing things that are worthwhile to communicate about. They have salaries that are, you know, that enable them to have that mobility where a lot of the expats in Asia were mostly English teachers with lower salaries. 
um, it was hard to have social mobility upward for a lot of expats, especially if they didn't know the language, especially because those languages are very hard, um, like Chinese. I was, I, honestly, I had only ever met two or three other people who could speak Chinese better than me, and that was because they worked for a TV station. So they were speaking Chinese on TV every day. Um, and so they had a real job outside of education. Um, and so it's really, really hard in Asia to make a life for yourself that's outside of the education sector, unless you start a business. And even then, it's hard as a foreigner to start a business and run a business, unless you've got a local partner, maybe that's got 51% of the business, or you've got um, you know really strong relationships. So Europe is like a t com completely different lifestyle that um, I'm, I'm trying to get used to. But it's also really interesting because I meet so many people and they're so wonderful and they're so interesting and they you know really want to spend time with me and, and do things. And it's just, it's a completely different lifestyle, but I really like it. And, and that's why I'm, I'm going to stick in Portugal for a while, because I just really love the experience of the city and the people I meet there. No, I can imagine. And uh, I know I've, I've only gone as a tourist uh, and I'm business as well to, to Lisbon a few times. Um, seems like a lovely, lovely place to live. And it's probably relatively economic, like relatively cheap. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not anymore. Uh, and of course, like it helps that of course that that Portuguese tend to speak very good tend to speak very good English as well. So it depends where you are in Lisbon. Oh yeah. Like I've I've walked into random businesses where nobody speaks English, and that's totally fine. I'll pull out the Portuguese words I know. Um, but I also find there's places where they can speak English, and then I don't get a chance to speak. So, anyways, I I'm curious. I'm curious. What what do you think made you become curious? I grew up in Stockholm, uh, but only for the first eight years of my life before moving to the south of Sweden. And that move always made me feel a bit outside. I had a different accent. I looked a bit different. You know, I was a bit different. So I, I always felt a bit outside of the local community. Um, and uh, that kind of, in, 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 in almost like a perverse sense, kind of awakens your curiosity because that, you know, that allows you, you know, that allows you not to be so stuck in the, in the, in, in the place where you, where, where, where you come from, which is kind of the example that you gave about in, in, in the first part of the conversation. Um, another component uh, and related to that is that my parents uh, are very, very curious beings so they are uh, both Swedish but actually met in London uh, so they lived in London in the 60s 70s which at the time uh, now it doesn't sound like much but at the time was very very uh, very um, uh, exotic right to move to a different to a different country in, in Europe so and I can see that a lot of my dad he's very very curious and that has sort of um, that has infected me a lot. Um, then it, it, it's kind of a snowball effect as well because when you sort of start to become interested in something and learn a bit more, it kind of learns into this learning system of roots, like this learning ecosystem, right? When you start to learn something about, you know, a, say a piece of culture or a specific feature, feature in a culture. Um, that to understand that, and if you have that, you know, if you have that pre predisposition of sort of being interested in understanding something, then in order to understand anything, then you need to be, you need to understand the other different components, and it kind of it's kind of a snowball effect that you know we start exploring stuff, then you want to explore other stuff, um, and uh, there's also diff very different kinds of curiosity, right? I'm, I am very much. Um, curious on exploring and sort of human behavior. Uh, it's something that I think that I share with you is, you know, sort of exploring different cultures and feeling, you know, taking one step away and sort of understanding there's different levels of curiosity. I see that a lot of our team members, for example, that might be very, very, very good at research and their curiosity is more in sort of in more into things than into, than into, into people. In my sense of people, um, and my kind of curiosity is very much related to peoples and cultures 
uh, and that might come just from first of all from being uh, very extrovert to uh, to my background and sort of moving around from from early childhood and also having parents that that, that obviously had been moving around a lot and and have that curiosity in them as well there might also be there might also be a deeper sort of cultural uh, component in that of of Scandinavians having a long, you know, I see from started exploring. This is sort of Vikings might, might have been the first explorers in the world, and there is a long culture of of uh, of traveling and living in different places, uh, and that might come just from a natural sort of need, right? You know, obviously the Scandinavian lands were not auto sufficient when it comes to when it comes to uh, supplies, so um, people had to start look elsewhere and. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a, there's a bit of that in my genes. I agree it starts with, you know, whoever is around you, right? So I was, I, was, I was going to ask you, how do you drive curiosity in others? But I think it's clear that curiosity has to be sparked from someone in your life or some experience in your life. So I moved from Miami to Pembroke Pines. It's not very far. It's like 30 minutes by car. But I was like 12 when it happened. So it would, my entire world changed. And, and I sounded like everyone. Yeah, I, I looked like everyone. I sounded like everyone. Nothing changed in that regard. It's just everyone was different. Um, and actually, two of my best friends, they're twins. They ended up moving right across the street from me. Like, I didn't know them until they moved there. Um, and, and their, their families from Cuba, like their parents literally were on rafts as kids from Cuba. So they had this like very different mentality and Spanish was their first language. Um, even though the, you know, they were also fluent in English. They, so the parents raised them bilingual and, um, and the parents could speak English, had learned to speak English, obviously living in the States for all those decades. But, um, but yeah, I got, I was around them quite a lot and they were extremely intelligent they were a year a year or two younger than me and yet they ended up graduating two years ahead of me because of the fact that like in summertime they were doing uh in, in middle school they were doing high school classes during the summertime and in high school they were doubling up and doing college classes and so they ended up they ended up graduating high school in two years and were already juniors in college when they were like 16 or 17 and they ended up having double, double degrees from the, the, we ended up going to the same university together. Um, but anyways, but it started with my parents. My, my mom said that I was reading like the encyclopedia at the age of three, right? <laughs> that sounds like me, like reading the encyclopedia, reading the atlas. I was into the atlas from the very beginning. So I got an atlas when I was a kid and sort of started exploring. And that kind of, but possibly that, those kind of simple actions also kind of uh, generate your curious mind or kind of, kind of help towards that, right? My mom taught me how to write cursive when I was like five or six. And she was constantly pushing books on me, taking me to the library, taking me to the bookstore, getting me like whatever I wanted and just kind of like giving me the opportunity to, to do whatever it was. And um, I think those things were also very helpful. And like when I was 12 or 13, they got me a bank account and they taught me about, you know, checks and balancing. Obviously, that's useless now. Um, and my brother was really into finance. And so I saw him like buying and selling things on eBay in his teens. And like I saw him always hustling to try to make money. And uh, he taught me a lot more about personal finance and things when I was like a lot younger. So I just had like these, um, these people around me very close to me that were always just encouraging me by example to, to be curious. I think it's a really cool example we gave there on the, on your, on your neighbors. Um, in entrepreneurship, there's a, there is a mad unproportional concentration of, of people who have migrated, uh, and they, they could be a lot behind that. So, you know, the, the mere necessity of, of, you know, especially if you're, if you're moving, if you're in, if you're a refugee, moving to a new country, um, you should sort of starting your own business is your only option. 
but um, but I'm sure there there's also a sort of um, there's also a relation to to how how migrating or how moving sort of opens your mind, allows you to see things from different angles, allows you to sort of to 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 understand opportunities that if you have never sort of uh, left your, you know, if you've always lived in the same spot, or you, you know, it obviously makes it much more difficult to think outside the box and 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 to see those opportunities. So I think there's a lot. Uh, I think there's a lot, a lot to that, uh, and that might sort of that might be very cultural as well. Sort of going back to how Scandinavians uh, were might have been the first explorers. <laughs> That's probably a myth uh, because they were probably explorers long before. But the reason why people started, you know. Uh, Going to different continents on on um, and to continental Europe on on boats was basically because of necessity. So, you know, and if we look at states, which is probably has the sort of strongest and one of the stronger entrepreneurial cultures in the world, I wouldn't be surprised if that has to do with it being a a country of now probably down to fifth, sixth generation of immigrants. But in the end. Um, the States is quite a new, a new country in that sense. Right? They actually ended up going on to create a company, not the parents, but them, the two of them. Um, and, and their mom was actually a teacher. And so she was the one that was encouraging them to learn more and to take more classes and to get out of school faster. And uh, so, yeah, they ended up starting a, a B2B SaaS and they've been running it for like, I think, 10 years. And they they do multiple millions a year from the business. They they gross multiple millions. So in Mexico, you see, especially in the in the sort of the current startup scene or the sort of startup scene that we could that we could um, um, that has sort of grown over, maybe not so much during twenty twenty two, but especially the years before that, right, the two thousand seventeen two thousand twenty one. Um, there is an appro- uh, there is an um, proportionate amount of. Uh, of people coming from other countries in Mexico, and that doesn't mean that Mexicans are bad entrepreneurs. It's just I think it's just it's a sort of natural fold out, and you can see that in in those Mexican entrepreneurs might be sort of they, they might be people who moved to elsewhere, right, to to the states or elsewhere in Latin America, um, to have a stronger disposition of 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 uh, of creating companies. So sort of thinking outside the box. I think it comes down to. Right? So I've experienced in China, Vietnam, and Portugal the same exact thing, which is generally locals who start businesses tend to not speak English and tend to only look at their domestic market for their business. And I think the reason why you may not hear of businesses being successful globally from many different countries is because they're either those people left their country and went to the US, for example, to get access to VCs or a greater market or a different understanding of the world to be able to look at it globally, or an American went to another country and and started a business and, and that business was determined to be focused globally, even though they chose this country as a base of operations. And so, um, For example, I met uh, a French guy who was living in Vietnam a few years back, and he was building a business, but he wasn't going to serve the Vietnamese company, uh, Vietnamese economy. I, as an American living in Vietnam, had a Singaporean company, and I wasn't looking to serve the Vietnamese economy, right? So I think a lot of expats generally aren't really looking at the domestic economy. They're generally looking at a global economy. Um, for what they want to serve, but then when you have locals, if they're in their own country, they tend to just focus domestically. And I, I think that um, I've heard of this quite a lot in Europe as well. So in in Asia and Europe specifically, they're like very focused on their own economy. That's kind of interesting in in our case because um, the way that we have mounted it. So I am obviously Swedish, and my 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 business partner co-founder is Brazilian. Uh, so we're classic examples of of of, of, of migrants, really, of, of you know people that have come from elsewhere and, and ended up in Mexico for different reasons. Um, our business has been fully focused on the Mexican market. Uh, it's kind of maybe it's kind of a short to mid run uh, approach. We don't we 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 plan to launch in other countries in the future when we have when it makes sense from a sort of synergy perspective. So when the product 
um, uh, has you know enough exportable features uh, and for it for us to make for us for it to make sense in to launch another country then then we we will do so so and it's not necessarily the product also the team right we have a you know when we have a big enough and we of, of a talent pool um, then we can sort of take the idea that has worked here and if we know that we have a strong enough team that is working on on, on that kind of development then that then it will make a lot of sense to to uh, to uh, to start in other countries this is quite a bit different to approach to many of the startups some of our competitors that that have kind of tried to launch everything everywhere at the same time um, which could also be a successful approach, especially if they sort of launch with a lot of seeds and sort of understand where it grows and focus on that. Um, I guess we were a bit lucky there in that sense that we had a, a, a strong feeling that, that our that our business model, that we actually had a good product market fit from the beginning. It turned out we had a decent fit and, and we're working on that. Um, but that there's obviously a series of different approaches to that and, and sort of international expansion. Um, can it obviously works well in certain in certain business lines there's no question about it you have a a unique position in that as a foreigner you could see something domestically that was like oh there's an opportunity here that maybe other people didn't see or didn't try or tried and didn't know how to do it in a way that could work so you know in hindsight, you have a great business and focusing on the Mexican economy is great. If you came to me a few years ago and you were like, hey, Sean, I want to do this thing in Mexico. What do you think? I'd be like, you're nuts. Why would you want to do that? You're a foreigner, right? From my experience in a lot of countries that I've been to, being a foreigner and opening a business in that country, focusing on that economy is a really bad idea because you're just going to get destroyed by other companies that know the language and have relationships. And so, yeah, you, you were in a good position and, and that makes sense. I think if someone were to try to compete against you by launching this all over the world, it wouldn't work because you need to make a certain set of APIs for that country. So you'd have to have a hundred million dollars ready to just throw it like, Two million on this country, two million on the, like you, you just you just can't do it to to create APIs at scale across different use cases for different economy. It just doesn't make sense. So the way you're doing it is right. It sounds so 2020 to me that that approach was just throwing throwing money on stuff. But uh, we'll see how how that how that sort of folds up. Actually, really interesting, and, and I'm uh, I'm, pure, um, I'm aware that we're running out of time, but. Um, it, it kind of folds back into one, one of the sort of main kind of main fundamentals, the main basis for, for our idea is actually based on trust. And this folds back really nicely into, into curiosity. So one thing that having worked a lot with Latin marks in Latin America more than anything, and also a bit in Southern Europe and coming from Northern Europe, um, allow me to see an absolute market failure. And it's a market failure that's, that's, that's common for emerging markets, but also elsewhere. That's related to trust. Uh, Scandinavia has one of the highest sort of social trust levels in the world. And if we, you know, it's very difficult to measure, of course, but there are measurements and sort of there's a trust index showing, you know, uh, where people trust others more than, than elsewhere. And Within Scandinavia, those trust levels are extremely high. People trust, it's actually gone down a bit in Sweden, but if we use Scandinavia as a whole, it's still on top of, of, any, sort of, of any sort of trust index where neighbors trust each other, so that people trust each other in the community, people trust politicians, people trust sort of public figures, etc., which is very different, especially to emerging markets like uh, some of the Latin American countries. In some of the Latin American countries has some of the lowest trust indexes in the world. Um, and one thing that this plays out for, and this is a bit of a chicken, egg, you know, is it called a chicken and egg situation? Is that what we call it? Yeah, we are, you know what I mean. Uh, is that um, access to information and to data often uh, allows for more trust, and trust often comes to public. If it's often related to public information, so 
it's not surprising that it would not be a surprising to learn that in in Sweden, as is the closest example, in the end of the 18th century, uh, there was a public policy called the public policy or public information established, basically saying that everything that's governmental or local government or or or, or, or state government, any kind of information coming from that should be made public, and that's something that you know, that still exists. And I remember growing up in the library, seeing, you know, all people reading the, you know, the tax information about other people. So it was published, you know, how much tax each and every one pays in, in a book in the library. Now it's obviously available online. So but basically people could go to the library and see how much money their neighbors were, were, were making. There's public information about you say you know you name it you know how much who's a policeman and who say who's a prisoner what cell what prison they sit in what for uh, that kind of information that elsewhere it's just unheard of is made public in Scandinavia and I'm sure that you know the level of trust has allowed for that to happen but there's also that also adds to the level of trust and I see that a lot in the market failure in 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 financial services in 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 the Latin American countries where you know. Financial institutions basically do not have enough information to make solid credit decisions, not on consumers or on or on, on companies. And that has led to the access to finance being extremely, extremely low. Um, that always fall, obviously folds into our idea. And it's been something I've been I've been questioning since since started working in, in Latin America, which basically started in, in, in the year 2008, being you know why? You know what, what's what's you know what's happening in these in these cultures? Why do people not share data? Um, and that's that's been a strong mission for us since since uh, since our, the beginning of our idea, and something that we are working uh, hard for. And it folds nicely back into how curiosity allows us to sort of develop an idea, and also back into trust, right? Like mm, the availability of data has a very close relationship with the level of data, I should say, but the, the availability of information has a very close relationship to sort of public trust and, and, and trust in, in, in the community and society as a whole. Yes, it's a very interesting conversation, and I'm sure that we could definitely talk for a few more hours about it. Um, I would love to pick that one up another day. Yes. <laughs> On the trust. Yeah, trust is uh, definitely another topic. For sure, I, I Chinese people and Vietnamese people have no social trust whatsoever. I could spend a lot of time talking about the ways in which there's no trust, but I'll hold that for another day. So, how can people follow up with you? Follow the company Sintage uh, on on LinkedIn, and that's the social. That's my social network. The only one I'm 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 really active on. Uh, so the best way to get in touch with me is when on on LinkedIn, without a doubt. All right, great. So thank you very much, Sebastian. I appreciate your time and your energy. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you're not curious, then what the hell are you doing with your time? Really? Like, just, we only have one life. And if you're not curious, you're wasting that life. That's it. Thank you, Sebastian.